I'm a third generation colourman. My father and my grandfather before me. Originally we were in the east end of London, but in the 1970s the Greater London Council wanted to shoo manufacturing out of the city and we moved to South Wales in 1976, I believe. Initially we were very much a producer of letterpress and lithographic inks, and inks even today form a large part of what we do, but in 2009 we brought uh, the Spectrum Paint Company into the fold, so today we find ourselves as perhaps one of the most diverse colour houses in the UK, across a range of product lines, machines, mixers, you name it, all slurping and glurping and making a, a, a great sound and vibrant colours, across quite a diverse product range from printmaking inks for etching, relief, lithography, through to artistic paints. I'm hugely grateful to my forebears that we didn't jettison any machinery or product lines or the capacity to produce some beautiful products in quite large quantities. So today we find ourselves almost the perfect size. We have eight mills, we have numerous mixers, a well-equipped uh, laboratory. We're able to make beautiful products in sufficient quantities that we can uh, supply a service that I think no others provide. In recent years, there's been a very steady growth in all disciplines of printmaking. Perhaps people have discovered that um, in painting, you can only do one painting at a time, but in printmaking, you can make from the same plate 50 or 100 images. And people have experimented at home using a spoon rather than the press and uh, using any raised surface as a, uh, a printing plate. You name it, if it's got a raised surface, for example, it can be used for relief printing. And as a consequence, a number of people are trying um, printmaking for the first time. And I want to use this opportunity to give some basic advice. And the first is to aim high in terms of the paper that you print upon. I feel in many ways that uh, printmakers that are starting out, if they use inappropriate paper, really they're making life very difficult for themselves. The ideal printmaking paper has lovely long fibres. They remember the time that they were once part of a tree and they still have a hole running through every single fibre. It's called a lumen. And the more oily parts of a printmaking ink will enter that lumen and they will, through osmosis, move from one end to the other, capillary action. And we find that that aids the drying process. But if we don't use a lovely absorbent printmaking paper, but instead we use a cheap photocopy paper, for example, well, there are several things that make that paper unsuitable. The first is the fibre length will be very short, and so it won't be able to wick or pull the oil very far away. The second thing is it'll have a lot of china clay to make the paper white. That's no use for the drying process of a printmaking ink. And thirdly, and this is perhaps the greatest problem of all, that when a printmaker is producing a print, they need a uniform absorbency so that they don't see a pattern in the paper. The pattern that China clay gives can be quite mottled and unappealing. So all of these things, they either influence the image that we get, or the drying time, or the absorbency, all those things can stack against the first-time printmaker, so always aim high in terms of paper choice. The next bit of advice is that generally, printmaking inks do not have added dryers. The reason is that they're used all over the world, from the coldest climates through to very hot areas. And so if there was a lot of dryer in the ink, well, many would complain that it was drying on the slab or on the roller. So they arrive at the printmaker without dryer. So if you're in a cold climate, or if you're in an area where there's very high humidity, we'd recommend that you add 4 or 5% of a siccative. Actually, the humidity is even more important than the temperature. You remember, perhaps if you used gloss paint to paint a door frame, if it's oil-based, and you don't want to wash out the brush tonight, you can put it in a jar of water. What are you doing? Well, you're simply putting it in a 100% humidity environment. The water stops any air getting to dry the paint on the brush. The following day, you take the gloss paint brush out and you shake the water off and you carry on. Well, a very high humid environment will have exactly the same on printmaking inks. 
time stands still. Cold air can't contain much moisture. That's why we see our breath on a cold day. So if the temperature goes down at night in a studio, time is standing still. So make sure that you have an area where air is moving, and ideally it's dry air, and if you can afford it, it's warm air too. Each of those things will allow the um, print to dry. Each print can be better hung or put on a rack so that they're not stacked one on top of the other. And if uh, uh, drying is a, a particular issue for you, sometimes people will make an area, a, a box, which they can put a, a heater in and they'll put uh, the prints in there to dry. All of these things will help uh, the first-time printmaker produce prints which will dry quickly. Another piece of advice I'd like to give, especially to the new printmaker, is to be careful that they don't apply too much ink. We call that a very heavy film weight. And a heavy film weight does not improve, necessarily, the print quality. In fact, many times, it, rather than making it look more dense, we get a phenomenon called ink squash with relief printing, where if we apply too much ink, when it goes through the impression, either under the pressure of a, sp a spoon or through a press, the ink shoots sideways, so we have a heavy image area, then we get a strained ghostly halo, and then we get a solid line outside our image area. So if adding more ink does not solve the problem, what does? Well, perhaps a little oil might overcome the problem, or perhaps a little wiping compound. Certainly they're preferable than applying an awful lot more ink. Very heavy film wakes also quite often tease out a mottle in the paper, so best to start with a low film weight and work up as we require, rather than applying the ink by the spadeful. In 2014, I was involved in a campaign to save the use of cadmium pigments for use in artist colours. And along with my big and friendly competitors, I was somehow picked as a spokesman, uh, a little like David and Goliath. And I went to the EU, who were very reasonable in listening to our argument, which was essentially this. The first was to apologise. We'd been very lazy as an industry. We described these simply as cadmium colours. We didn't give them their full title, cadmium sulphides. And a cadmium that we put in a pigment no more resembles a metal than the sodium chloride, the salt that you put on your chips. But we had been careless, and so explaining that these were cadmium sulphides, we entered a dialogue with them. The reason they wanted to ban cadmium was laudable. They were trying to stop the cadmium in batteries going for landfill. But they were using quite a blunt instrument to try and stop them, stop all cadmium use in any situation. So we said we have a special case. These provide beautiful, vibrant oranges and fiery reds. They're used to uh, uh, apply to cooking utensils and all sorts of lovely, colourful use where the uh, cadmium colours really are irreplaceable. And we explained, and we were listened to in our case was taken seriously, that the cadmium sulphides we use are very low soluble, which means that if you were foolishly to eat them, they would pass through you. But more importantly, we handle these products well, and we also encourage artists to respect these colours, even though the risk is uh, uh, they're theoretical in a way. We would never encourage anyone to be careless with any raw material. When people visit our factory, they'll see a big sign which says there's no such thing as a safe chemical, just safe ways of handling them. So we saved uh, the use of cadmiums. We're delighted that we did. They form a very important part of the palette that an oil painter can use. And uh, we've made sure that they live for another day. But also it goes hand in hand with environmental care in the way that we manufacture and encouraging artists to make sure that they uh, recycle, that they uh, will look after their own waste streams, and indeed they're not careless in the way they handle this or any other raw material. There's been a lot of discussion recently about pigment white for zinc white, and indeed the fact that it goes brittle over a period. Now, this is not new news, because it's not a new pigment. It's been used for 250 years. Van Gogh was a great uh, fan of zinc-containing whites. But the question is how much we're going to take zinc out of common use. Now, the problems are there. 
the fact that the film does go brittle. The uh, evidence uh, from a number of studies shows that that is the case. But it would be wrong to suggest that zinc is somehow wicked and all other pigments are perfect. Even good old pigment white 6, titanium white, it is, behaves in a rather spongy way once it's dried as a film. And together they work well by adding a bit of zinc to titanium white. For example, uh, the yellowing is reduced and the uh, speed of drying is increased and the combined effect of the two can, contributes quite a bit. I suspect that over the years, zinc white will quietly uh, disappear from use, but it'll probably be because of public perception rather than technical reasons alone. Pigment white 4 used in zinc white is associated with some problems, but I suspect it's a bit like the uh, advice we're given to avoid a swan because it'll break your arm. I'm yet to meet anybody whose arm has been broken by a swan, and I'm yet to meet many people who've had particular problems with zinc white. They are there for our own production. We monitor everything we've produced, but I would myself prefer to use a product which is made beautifully, made really well under superb QC from uh, quantifiable raw materials, rather than something which doesn't contain zinc, but has been made uh, in a place beyond any provenance or with other raw materials that I'm uncertain of. So my own personal opinion is that zinc still has a part to play. The advice we give to anyone using zinc, of course, is not to use it as a base layer, not to use it in very thick film weights, and allow the product, uh, the painting, to dry in controlled conditions to get the best from uh, any pigment, uh, any paint that contains zinc.